Hello everybody, Ranger Mark Mello with the Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park welcoming you to our 20th Ranger Chat. Throughout the month of August, we have been celebrating and commemorating the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution which granted women the right to vote. And we have talked a lot about some of those pivotal figures from the Blackstone Valley uh, who were involved in the movement. People like Elizabeth Buffum Chase, Abby F Kelly Foster, Sarah Louisa McCormick, and others. But we really have not discussed what made the 19th century such an important and pivotal time uh, and a catalyst, really, for change. What factors went into that and promoting such movements as the women's rights movement, abolitionism, temperance, and other progressive movements which were trying to make the nation a better place. So this week, we're going to join former professor at Assumption College, Dr. John McClymer, and former National Park Service Ranger Chuck Arney as they discuss just that, what made the 19th century such a prime time for change. John, could you just set us with a landscape, if you will, about what was going on in America in the mid-1800s? Mid-1800s is a time of enormous change. We like to think that we're now living through times of unimagined change and that no one has lived anything like through the kind of changes that we see. I mean, if you were traveling overland in 1820, you were going about the same speed Julius Caesar would have 2,000 years earlier. And within a few years, you were on a train going 40 or 50 miles an hour across distances that seemed, would have seemed incredible that you could possibly travel. You could go from Worcester to Boston in under an hour, which, by the way, is no slower than you could do it now. Uh, so there is this tremendous shift, and it really shakes people out of their sense of what's possible, what's not possible, and all kinds of vistas open up. And that's going to be part of why reform is going to be so important, because people now have lost that settled sense that you have to live within these constraints that have always dictated what people can and can't do. And if things that had been true for all this time are suddenly gone, you get this new sense of possibility. If you look through the North, and part of this reform ethos is this passion for self-improvement. And you can see it in all kinds of societies, uh, mechanics societies. There's one, of course, in Worcester that builds Mechanics Hall, which is still with us, fortunately. Uh, but they had, they sponsored, if you join the Mechanics Society for a small fee, uh, they sponsored lectures, they sponsored courses, some in areas related to being a mechanic, so, for example, uh, mechanical drawing and these kinds of things. But they also sponsored lectures in a whole array of subjects, and they created libraries so that any member could then take out books. And there were lyceums, which were voluntary societies which sponsored lectures. And lyceums often also sponsored libraries. And there were debating societies and young men would join the debating societies. And so everywhere you look, you see this passion for learning. Uh, and it's amazingly eclectic. People seem to be interested in just about everything. So if you look at the list of lectures that the Lyceum Society would sponsor, it would be everything from phrenology, you know, the study of bumps on the head to determine character to celestial mechanics, to women's rights, to anti-slavery, to various kinds of diet, like the Graham diet, or other kinds of alternative medical systems, to courses on history. Uh, there's just this incredible array of topics. And clearly, people were interested in everything. Uh, and that, that's, again, a very big difference between the North and the, very, the tremendous current of reform in the North and in the South, where this is really very much missing. Uh, but Northerners are really intent on changing the world, starting with themselves. Americans create a very gendered culture through the 19th century, so that almost everything is either masculine or feminine. And one of the gendered ideas starts to be religion. So some historians have written about what they call the feminization of American Protestantism as the actual day-to-day -day business of religion becomes part of women's work. And women take over a lot of the fundraising and other sorts of essential, if behind the scenes, church activities. 
uh, and they'll carry this over into other kinds of reform activities. So if you look at the abolition movement, for example, you'll see that there are all kinds of abolition fairs where women who have been knitting or baking or doing all sorts of traditional female things are then bringing what they produce to these fairs. People are buying it, the money is being donated to the anti-slavery society. Uh, and so there is a kind of natural progression into the events of the day out of the woman's sphere, as it was usually called. I would like to thank all of you for joining us again this week for this Ranger Chat. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave those down in the comments below. We would love to hear from you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you out there along the Blackstone really soon.